Hallelujah. Miss Kathleen's going to the door. I, uh, who remembers what last Sunday was? Huh? Was the 23rd? Okay. Anybody else? There you go. It was, it was Pentecost Sunday. Okay. So, I guess I forgot what date it was, but, um, uh, um, Amen. Half the congregation just left. All right. So... John, tell me again what the date was. It was the 23rd. I did not take care of this last week, and I uh, actually remember, was told Kathleen, you know, I want to make a big deal out of the 23rd of May this year. Does anybody know what the 23rd of May was? Say that. It was his anniversary of moving into this building. It wasn't the anniversary of the church, but it was the anniversary of moving into this building. Um, that was, uh, it was, no, was it 17 years? Yeah, yeah, that's, I knew it was, was it 17? I was thinking it was 16, huh? He was six months old. Wow. And Sean Spangler and I were talking about this the other day because, you know, they, they live somewhere uh, out of town. He works at TCU now, and, and so the, they're uh, going somewhere else. But we remembered uh, uh, Peyton graduated um, this week. And when we were in the tent and we had the kitty corral, for those that haven't been here uh, since the beginning, we got a vision of the kitty corral because we, we didn't have any way to have a nursery when we were in the tent and I look back one day Peyton could just barely stand up and during worship she's hanging on to the fence and she's got one hand in the air oh, yeah. and I said we're going to raise our babies in church and that's the reason we have a kitty corral and we've never had a nursery and and uh, sometimes that doesn't fit for some people. Um, but we've watched how the kids have grown up in church and watched um, the different ones that... Uh, so 17 years here, and I was thinking it was 16, so it was 17 years ago we moved into this building. I remember... Uh, was 2000. Two, I think, when we set the tent up right here on this, on this spot, and Glenn Smith preached this first Sunday here. We'd moved from, for those that don't know, we're called Silverado Cowboy Church because we started out in the Silverado Cutting Horse Barn, um, and I do remember when that was. That was the year. That was August of 2000, and uh, uh, Toy and Tanya. Uh, probably the only original members that are still left here, if I'm correct, um, from that. But the first Sunday that we had the tent, and that was, uh, was 2003. Um, no, 2002. Glenn Smith preached the first service, and there were so many cars pulled into the parking lot. He looked at me, and he said, Simmons, where are you parking them next week? And we made a driveway up on the hill. And they started parking up there on the hill where the school is now. And so, you know, as we look at those things. And, um, and I'm reminiscing because I didn't remember to do it last week. Um, we, uh, 
I would think I'd never forget because the next day uh, I uh, went to the hospital for a few days. Um, and we're not going to spend any time there, are we, John? There are some things that it's abomination to remember, and that's one of them for me. Um, I should have learned then not to go to Starbucks on t in, in the morning because I was on the way to Starbucks when all that happened. Anyway, I started talking last week about, uh, and, and, and that's really why I bypassed all that about uh, being uh, our anniversary of moving into the building was because, and, and it only comes around, I think, every seven years on a Sunday. So that was only actually the second time that it had happened on a Sunday since we've been in the building. And I forgot the last time because John Somerville came and talked the first time uh, on our anniversary that, that time. And so, um, but I started talking about what are you going to do with the anointing? And uh, you remember we went through uh, uh, Saul and the anointing that he actually walked in in the very beginning. Um, and this is why it's important for us to think about what we're going to do with that anointing. Because the anointing isn't to be annoying. And sometimes people that uh, believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit uh, let it become an annoying factor because it's like I got it and you don't uh, when we look at other Christians. In, in other denominations. And here's the thing that you've got to remember. The anointing is about how you're going to move with God, how you're going to handle the Word, what you're going to do, and, 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 it, and it doesn't end. It can't stop. With Saul, we looked and, and, uh, it, and it had stopped kind of where we ended up. I'll read the last uh, uh, the verses that we uh, looked at last week. It says, now the word of the Lord came to, this is uh, 1 Samuel 15, 10 and 11. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and, has performed, and not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. So, Here's what we have to do. We have to remember that if we get off, it's time to get back. It's not that all of a sudden we go, well, I'm so far away from God, I don't want to go back. We've got to get in that position that we realize the anointing, number one, should keep us in the right place. The leading of the Holy Spirit keeps us focused on what God wants us to do, how he wants us to do it. And it's not about me. Um, it's, it's not about the prayer language, but, but that is a fact that goes with it. And so that it tells us in Romans that, uh, the spirit prays for things that we don't even know how to. And so we realize that there's a position that that becomes part of it, but that's not wh where we stop. I remember one time, uh, I was associate pastor in a, a church in Chowchilla, California, and uh, there was a an old dear saint that uh, she had I, I, she had been in that church since it, it began, and she used to tell about how uh, one time the the roof had actually caught fire from what was going on in the church, and it didn't burn anything. And I asked her this. I said, uh, her name was uh, Mrs. Sims. I said, Sister Sims, what, what is it that's different about today than was then? She said, because when we'd come to church on Sunday, we may not go home until it's time to go to the field on Monday. We would stay in the altar and we'd pray and we'd seek God and we, we, we would do those, what it took just to hear what God had to say. And sometimes I think, you know, we've got so much stuff going on now. Would we do that today? And, uh, you know, and it wasn't about the roof burning or, or, any, or not burning, but being on fire or anything else. But it was about spending time just seeking God, whatever it took to do that. Um, 
we uh, have the prayer camp in Abusa, Nigeria, and one of the reasons that we started that prayer camp is because there was no prayer camps in Delta State. But the, the Nigerians would go sometimes two states away, which meant a bus ride or a two-day walk to get somewhere. Um, states aren't like here in the United States. Um, and those Nigerians will go and, and they'll stay and pray until they hear what they came to pray for, pray about. And, uh, and if, if that means two or three days or a week or two weeks, they don't go home. Which also means, because there's no food there, that, that also means all they have is water because we drilled a well there so they could have water, but there's no food for them to get. They have to walk to town, which is a full day walk and back in order to, to go eat if they wanted to eat, but they stay there until they hear what God has to say. Now, that's not about anybody else, but it gets to the position that sometimes, and, and I remember one uh, Wednesday night when Kathleen was leading prayer time, uh, when Gloria used to do prayer time on Wednesday nights, and 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 for I think it was raining or something. Kathleen led prayer time, and uh, she got to the point that she said, uh, "Okay, now we're going to pray." So everybody just go ahead and pray, and and it was about I remember I was sitting back there where Tom is right now, and I remember that. Uh, I, did, I thought I just barely started praying. And all of a sudden, she's up talking again. And I asked her later about it. She said, wh I, I said, why, why did you just start talking again? She says, because that's about the length of time most people spend in prayer. And I couldn't tell her she was wrong. Because really, the truth was, and it wasn't even five minutes. And, and so when we think about that, it made me really think, okay, do I take the same time to spend with God that I would always spend with him before. And remembering going to uh, uh, one of the minister's refreshings that uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin used to do when he was alive, um, I went to a... I got to move this so I'll quit playing with it. <clears throat> I keep thinking it's going to fall off the podium, so I been moving it around um i went to a how to pray for your ministry um and hey i wanted to hear how am i going to pray for my ministry and and jim hockaday was the uh, instructor at that time in in prayer time um and prayer and healing school and, and jim hockaday gets up and he says how many of you prayed in the holy ghost when you first started out in ministry because you didn't know what to do and I mean, all of us raised our hand. And he says, what'd you quit for? He says, if you hadn't quit, you wouldn't be here. And it made me think, do we quit seeking God the same way later on than we did in the very beginning? And that's something we have to evaluate each one for ourselves. And, and that's what stood out about Saul, was Saul was right on he, was, he prophesied, he traveled with the prophets, and then he got made king, and he got too big for his britches. And so sometimes we have to think about that. So here's where we're going to go with, with part two. We're still in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, this is right after what, what, what I just read, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I've rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn and go, and I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Chapter 17, uh, verse 31 through 39. Now, here's, this is, and what's transpired in the middle of this is David was anointed king. Wasn't his time yet. He was still to serve Saul as long as the King Saul was alive. And so, here we are in chapter 17, and, and we know that he's uh, about to, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with chapter 17 at all, it's the account of 
David and Goliath. And we're going to pick up down in verse 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they were reported to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart faint because of him, talking about Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to fight against the Philistine. To fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant will kill both, has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing that he's defied the armies of the living God. David right there made the statement about what the anointing is about. It's about God. What does God want in my life? How does he want me to do it? It's not so that do we get to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Absolutely, that's that's part of it. I talked about the icing and I talked about the cake and realized that Kathleen's not here to shake her head now. Um, the, the icing on the cake is that you get to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and you get to do the things. You get to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons freely. I've been, you've been given, freely give. That's what Jesus said to do. That's part of what that anointing is about. But that anointing is about God. It's about putting God first in your life, glorifying God through your life, and bringing other people to know Jesus Christ because the anointing in your life brings you to the position that you can do the works that God's asked us to do. Now, John and I both over the last few months, and I'm, I don't know... Uh, where uh, we're going from here but we've been talking about the words that we say and and doing the work and healing the sick cleansing the lepers raising the dead one of the things that I thought about last week and I talked about this real briefly not even this was we were in the tent up on the hill because we were building this building and and the way the church started it was in the tent right here Um, and then when we were gonna build the building then I moved the tent up where the school is now. And uh, let me just say that uh, when we moved the tent up there, it, it had to be God because it was solid rock and we drilled holes for every one of the uh, stakes that we put in to put the tent up. Um, and I actually remember what uh, Harvey told me. I was trying to help him do this, and Harvey looked at me and he said, you're the traffic director. You just tell us what to do. And, and uh, you know, that was the, what he felt was, was the anointing that, that, that uh, he, they were supposed to do this. And uh, one of the things we have to remember, remember that the anointing will keep you in the position that you're supposed to be in. And that's not about who was going to tra- direct traffic and who was going to do what. But it's about realizing that the anointing, if we'll listen to God, it'll keep us in the position that we're supposed to be at the time we're supposed to be at, which doesn't mean that's a permanent position. But it does mean that that's where God wants me right now because there's somebody's life you're going to touch and you're going to change their life forever. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You've got to realize... God has a plan for your life. And it's the anointing that's going to bring that plan together in that place. And and, and you know, I call this, what are you going to do with the anointing? So David, here's David. He's anointed. And and remember in the Old Testament, we're going to just briefly stay in the Old Testament for a minute, and then we're going to the New Testament. Here's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the anointing. 
prophets, kings, and priests were anointed with the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus said, Go and wait in Jerusalem until you're endowed with power on high. And that's because every Christian, everybody that accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, the anointing is available to them. It's no longer kings and priests and, and uh, prophets. Now it's everybody that will receive. Everybody that will take it. Everybody that receives Jesus gets a portion of the Holy Spirit. There's an infilling that happens not one time, but it happens every day. And I have to be open to that anointing that's going to get stronger and stronger each day that I walk with God because I'm ready to listen to Him. I'm ready to... And I'm going to say it again. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have been given. Freely give. And we have to remember that. And, and, and as we do that, um, you know, and that's not, that's not about the, the people that uh, stand in the pulpit that operate in those gifts. You, you know if you've been here very long, the gifts don't operate from the pulpit they operate from person to person. It's not just whoever's preaching is going to operate in the gifts. It's going to be person to person. This is a body ministry, not a pulpit ministry. And we have to remember that each one of us is, is uh, you know, if we go to Ephesians, this is, uh, again, about the anointing. Ephesians, it, it, it says, uh, it's given to some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So each one of us should say, I don't care how young or old you are, I'm in the ministry because that's who we are as believers. Go, we're going on to uh, verse 37. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear... He will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David in his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword onto the armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk in these, for I've not tested them. So David took them off. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to stop there because that's all I wanted out of that, that particular scripture. One of the things to remember, don't fasten somebody else's anointing on because it won't work for you. It's not about operating in something we didn't know. Here's Saul who used to walk with God, who prophesied, who traveled with the prophets, who listened to God, who did what God said, got too big for his britches. He got off on his own, decided he was good. And now he's going to fasten on the armor instead of just trusting God. But David said, I'm not going to use these. I trust God. God's going to do, deliver this Philistine into my hand. In other words, hey, it's the Lord's battle. It's not mine anyway. And that's what we have to remember, that the anointing keeps us in that place, that we keep the focus, that it's God and not about me, not about anybody else, but it's about what the Father wants in each one of us. And that was the thing that Saul forgot. Go to 1 Samuel 24. This is going to be the last scripture in the Old Testament this morning, but we have to, we have to remember that... Um, there's a lot of things that when we look at the Old Testament that we realize it's not just history, but it's something that is a life application for each one of us. And David is a perfect example, example of a life application and how that went. Now, I'm not telling you to follow the sin that he got into, but he repented of that, and it was after that time that God called him a man after his own heart. Um, and so we realize that that uh, David wasn't perfect, but David walked in the anointing of God, and he was willing to repent when he came to the place that he hadn't done something, so that he hadn't done the right thing. So remember this: 
Don't get sidelined just because you think you messed up. Repent and get up and go on and let the anointing keep flowing. David is a perfect example of how that anointing kept flowing through his life even after he repented and he went on. He didn't let that, that keep him back. He kept going and listening to God. Okay, 1 Samuel 24 uh, verse 1 it says, Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines. It was told to him, saying, Take note, David's in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Paul, or excuse me, and then Saul look, took 3,000 men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in the rocks of the wild goats. So I'm going to stop there for a second. I want to tell you a funny story in the middle of this. I was reading this one time at En Gedi to a bunch of pastors we had taken. And right as I said, the mountain of the wild goats, a whole herd of wild goats walked right behind me across the, the mountain there. I thought, well, God, you sure set that up good. Anyway, let's go on. Verse 3. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. And David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you do to him as it seems good. And David arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And it happened afterward that David's heart was troubled in him because he'd cut, all, cut Saul's robe. And then he said to his men, Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he's anointed the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went his way. David, being anointed, didn't get too full of himself, didn't get too big for his britches. He still realized that Saul was in the position of being anointed by God to be the king as long as he was alive. And David was not to touch him. And not to take him. And that's one of the things we have to remember. We have to remember just because you wouldn't do something some, the way that somebody else does. Doesn't mean that you have the right to say, well, that's not the anointing. That's God's deal. You let God take care of that. You be anointed. You walk in the anointing that God's called you in. That's what David did in this place. And that's why I, I, I looked at this. Uh, the, a little bit later on in, in this chapter, we're going to stop right there. Saul came out and he looked at, and David told him, he says, here, I had the opportunity, but I didn't take it. But you keep chasing me and you keep coming after me. And Saul says, David, you're better than I am because I would have done it to you. And so what we see is David continued to walk in the anointing of God even in the position that he had delivered, that, that his enemy was right there in the palm of his hand, but he wasn't going to touch him because of what the Lord had said in the very beginning. Go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to come to the day of Pentecost now, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here uh, this morning in the, in the New Testament in, in where you and I live today and where we have to realize that this isn't just an account. If you've been here very long, you know that I've challenged you to read uh, Acts through four times in, in 30 days without stopping, without trying to study it. Just read it through because it'll change your life. We start thinking like the disciples thought. We start acting like the disciples did. They, they did. What did they do? They healed the sick. They cleansed the lepers. They raised the dead. They cast out demons. And we have the opportunity today where we live to be able to operate just exactly like that we come in contact with people all the time that we can change their life acts chapter 2 uh, verse 1 through 4 first it says when the day of pentecost had fully come 
They were all of one accord in one place. Does that sound like the church? It should sound like the church. I'm going to say this. I love our church because our church is a family that takes care of one another when we're hurting. We care about each and every one just because we're family. And that's what family does. But I'm going to tell you, not all the church... This is a lesson to us, not a, well, we're not this way. Because this can infill, infilter a church. There can be stuff going on where we're not in one accord. And the anointing happens when we're in one accord. And, and, and that's a, a caution to make sure that we stay where we need to be and be in one accord with one another. That's where the power comes. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I was preaching a camp meeting in a, in a little church one time, and I read that. And they didn't have air conditioning. They had the front door open and they had the back door open. And I happened to just stand in the right place. And just as I said, a rushing mighty wind, there's a breeze hit my microphone. But I'm going to tell you something. If we'll listen to what God's speaking to us, we'll hear that rushing wind. We'll hear that small voice. We'll have a tug on the inside that just says, hey, you need to do this. And we realize, you know, and so sometimes... Uh, we're, we're listening for a voice, and we're being tugged on a, in our spirit, man, and, and not pushed. God won't push you, but he'll lead you by the, by the spirit to do things. And when he does that, it, it'll be just like that rushing mighty wind. It'll be yes. And when you do it, it's yes. This feels so right. It works so good. Everything falls into the right place, even if it might have looked ugly or felt ugly in the very beginning. It was the way that God sent us to do it, and everything falls into that place. And there appeared to them divided tongues as fire, and one set up on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Go on down to the 14th verse. Here's something the anointing is about. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose since it's the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass that in the last days God says, I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your older men shall dream dreams. And my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth Beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that moreover, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now he preached on, he talked about what Jesus and everything that had happened. So now down in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord. What they said was, what, what do we need to do? All of the men that have been listening. Now, in this place, Peter, the tongues that he, he was speaking in at that time, uh, there were people in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost from all nations 
And they begin to hear Peter's talking in Hebrew and the other ones that were from other places. There were Cretans there um, and, and, and I forget all of the nations that were present. But they heard the other 11 talking in their language saying the same thing that Peter was saying. And so now they said, what do we need to do? With all this you're talking about, what do we need to do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call, even in Silver Auto Cowboy Church. You realize that? Even as, as many as the Lord will call. We're not talking about this is past. We're talking about we are a New Testament church that God has called. And I'm not talking about just this church. Christians should be New Testament people that operate in every area that this is. Because God cares about people that come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. God cares about people that need to be healed people that need to be raised from the dead. And, and I promise you that if you'll be open to all of this, there'll be an opportunity at some time in your life. We said, well, I'm not going to travel all over the place. I promise you. Here, here's something. I had a guy um, when, when I was looking for the trailer that I travel in when I do ministry. Um, I had stopped up here at... Uh, Willow Park at that, that dealer right there. And I got to know a guy. I never bought a trailer from him. But I got to know a guy who was a believer that actually came from a church that I'd known the pastor. Uh, uh, and he, uh, he just, he, that pastor had moved on. He wasn't in the ministry anymore. But I, but I knew this guy. And, and him and I got to fellowship. One day he calls me. He goes, hey, pastor, can I tell you something that happened to me? Yeah. He says, y is it okay if I call you sometimes and just share? And I, he still calls me once in a while. He called me, he told me, he says, I was, I was up at uh, Kathleen Lights, Jason's Deli. He says, I was eating at Jason's Deli the other, the other evening after, after work. I've met my wife there. and He says, we're standing right there at the salad bar, and a guy falls over smooth dead. Had a heart attack standing right there at the salad bar. He says, uh, they called the ambulance and the Lord says, lay hands on him. And he said, I walked over there and I laid hands on him and the man got up. He said, I didn't know him. He says, he got up and, and that with the, they went ahead and hauled him off in the ambulance because he had fell over dead. But he got up. And he said, and not only that, he says, I was sharing that in church the other day and found out the guy that I'd raised from the dead, his sister was on our worship team at church. And she said, he's telling the truth. He was dead. The doctor said he was dead. So you say, well, we're not going to raise the dead today. Yes, you are. If you'll stay open to what God wants to, to do, I'm telling you the anointing is available to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, and to see them come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Hey, this guy was saved. It didn't matter for him. He'd have probably been better off if he'd let him alone. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted him to get involved in that place, and that's what the anointing does. It leads you into that place. Man, I'll tell you what. When I was talking to this guy about a trailer, he was, he was cool. You know, it was... It was always good conversation, but I never heard anything as exciting as what he found right then. And that's so important to, to us to realize, hey, it is exciting to do what God's called us to do. It's not about the grind every day. Every, every one of us has got stuff that we do that becomes just the daily grind. And we can get so bogged down in that daily grind that we forget to spend time with the Father and realize that the leading of the Holy Spirit, that anointing is going gonna, is gonna to make that grind go, go better. It's going to be easier. It's going to be shorter just because 
that the anointing of God has caused us to flow in a way that we might not ever do. I'm going to tell you what. Steve has the opportunity probably more than any of the rest of us to get hands on people that are, that are uh, needing healing because if you don't know what he does, he's security at the hospital. Um, and uh, I, uh, I, he didn't know I was there one day. I texted him. I said, I didn't know you had to push wheelchairs around. Um, hey, what an opportunity. Keith Brown, one time we were in, uh, first time he came to Texas, um, we had stopped at a barbecue place, and in, in it, it starts with a B, and I don't remember where, what the name of it is, but it's right up there by the airport. And uh, there was a guy that came in there. He's on those polio crutches. Keith couldn't even eat. All he could think of is how he's going to get hands on that guy and be able to, to, to pray for him. Even to the point that he waited and watched till a guy headed for the door. And he's going to hold the door open just so he could get his hand on him. And that's what we have to be. We have to be those people that are ready to operate. By the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that wasn't about Keith just wanted to do it. He felt like the Lord had told him he was going to lay hands on that guy. And so all he's trying to do is figure out how this is going to work. And waited for that. Wait for the opportunity that God opens the door. Hey, I didn't witness the guy throwing his crutches away. But I don't know that he didn't. We have to remember this. You know, I had a guy ar argued with me one time. Um, actually, it was a pastor in Las Vegas, Nevada. I, we, Jerry B Martin and I used to do Bible studies with the, the rodeo cowboys three times a week. And, and uh, one year, Jerry wasn't there, and he had set up at this church for me to do the Bible studies. And uh, that, that pastor didn't believe what we believed. And uh, he came down to the... Uh, Kathleen and I used to have a booth there for ministries. And uh, he came down, well... There was four of us lined up because this guy got baptized in the Holy Spirit and he's laying on the floor behind me. And we didn't want everybody to make a spectacle out of it. So, and that pastor walked up right then. The other thing that had happened, somebody had came in in a wheelchair. They left the wheelchair and walked out. And uh, so the wheelchair is sitting there. And then somebody else is laying behind us, got filled with the Holy Spirit. And this pastor walks up and he looks at me and he goes, well, I guess I came too late to argue with you, and he just walked off. And that's the thing we have to remember. Don't spend your time arguing with people. Don't, don't make them think that you're right and they're wrong. You know, just do the work. If you do the work, it speaks for itself. The Holy, God, God doesn't need you to defend him. The Holy Spirit doesn't you, need you to defend him. Instead, he just needs you to operate in the, in the gifts of the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. When God leads you into that place, you just do it, and he'll defend himself. Amen. For this purpose is for you and your children and all those who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call. And many other words were testified and exhorted by them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the disciples' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Now, third chapter. Peter and John go into the temple. They get a lame guy. Um, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And they helped him up, and, and he went inside. And 5,000 came to know Jesus that day. Because the anointing that Peter and John were willing to operate in. Just because they listened when God gave them. Hey, that guy that they grabbed 
had to have been there even when Jesus walked into the temple because it said he'd been laid at the gate of the temple daily from his birth. So we realize that this opportunity came right now to operate in what God had told Peter and John to do, and 5,000 people came to know Jesus Christ because of that. Reason I laid that up, go to, to the fourth chapter of Acts, verse 13. This is what the anointing is about. Because now Peter and John got to spend the night in jail. They get called up into front of the same people that crucified Jesus. And this is what they said. This is what the people said. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. Where have you been? Where are you going to be? When we operate by the leading of the Holy Spirit, if we operate in that anointing, then exactly what will happen is we will become recognized as they've been with Jesus. I think that's the greatest honor that anybody can receive, that they realize you really are who you say you are. You really believe what you say you do. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. For indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and that's found in, in 1 Corinthians. But Paul's talking about righteousness because you have the Spirit of Christ in you first because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're led by the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again. Abba Father. Abba is a personal name that only a child can call the Father. It's my daddy. Only a, a real child can call that Father by that name. And this says because we're filled with the Spirit, we get to call him by that name. He is my Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And indeed, we suffer with him that we may be glorified together. What am I going to do? What are you going to do with the anointing? It's not about you. It's about him. It's about them. I've never done it. I see churches that do it. 
we know that uh, that we should it, over the door it it says entering the the mission field I, I was looking to see if the carpet was still up there we've got a carpet at the front that says bless going in and bless going out hey I'm going to tell you something we come in here to get recharged to fellowship together but not to let it, the charge go when we walk out the door we should the Bible says iron sharpens iron. This isn't about me preaching to you. It's about us encouraging one another, about growing together, about if, if, if you've been in the mully grubs for some reason, when you leave, somebody should have picked you up and, and, got, and dusted you off, and we go out so we can pick somebody else up and dust them off. So that we can heal the sick, so we can cleanse the lepers, so that we can raise the dead. Hey, I just gave you a testimony of, about a guy in Fort Worth in Jason's Deli. How many times do we go to a restaurant that you keep your eyes open and look for an opportunity to do something? He says, all I was doing was getting my salad. And a guy fell over smooth dead. And when they started saying, he's dead, he said, the Lord told me, he said, lay hands on him i never done anything like that before. You may not have done something before, but that doesn't mean God's not going to lead you to do it. If you'll stay open. I was thinking about this this morning as I did this. Sometimes we don't realize where the opportunity is going to come. I was in Tanzania with Brother Jerry doing a, he was doing a crusade on a soccer field. And he gave the altar call for salvation. I knew the next thing he was going to do was healing. And I'd been used in healing. I was excited. And he looked at me and he said, David, he says, go back there and take names with the, of those people that were uh, that just got saved. And I'm going to tell you, my heart fell in my boot because that wasn't what I wanted to do. Number one, he's the leader. Number two, I'm ordained with him. What you do is you do what, what you're supposed to do. You know what happened? I went back there and... And because I didn't speak the language, there's a, a lady there with, with me that she spoke the language and she was interpreting. And that one of the women that had accepted Jesus came up and she told her she had an issue of blood. It reminded me of uh, the seventh chapter of John, the lady that touched Jesus. And so I, I told uh, I told the lady, I'd lay hands on her stomach. And I, and I just laid hand, a hand on her shoulder. I said, in the name of Jesus, I tell this issue of blood to dry up right now and to, to go away. Hey, I'm supposed to be taking names. And she accepted Jesus, right? The anointing that God gives you, if you'll just do what you're supposed to do, he opens the doors where it changes everything. Lady went into the, the restroom that was there, and the issue of blood had stopped, so she went and got her daughter that was born without eardrums. And the Lord tells me, he said, lick your fingers and stick them in their ears. And I think, God, did you know where the, how dirty them ears probably are? And I did. And I spoke to her ears that she would be able to hear. And, and, and her mother got down. Now, I have no idea how this girl knew what her, her name was because her, uh, she's born without eardrums. And her mother got down and she yelled in her ear. And the little girl's eyes didn't, didn't move. So I knew she didn't hear her. Lord says, lick your fingers again. And I think, man, I just had them in her ears, Lord. But I did it. I did what he told me to do. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I speak to these ears to have eardrums. And then I looked at the mother and I said, don't yell, you'll hurt her. And she said, Susan. And a little girl looked up. Like I said, I have no idea how she even knew what her name sounded like. 
She just heard something. Josh Bolger's son was 14 then. He ran across that soccer field over here where this little girl, girl couldn't see him. He said, Susan. And she looked at him. Now, the reason I told that is because you don't know what you might be doing when God will open the door for you to do something that will change somebody's life. Number one, they accepted Jesus as their Savior. Number two, mother didn't have an issue of blood anymore, and the little girl can hear because she got eardrums. I'll never forget Josh Bolger's boy. His name is Josh, too. He's running for the bus. Brother Jerry, she can hear. Brother Jerry, she can hear. And he's yelling for everybody to hear. He was so excited. You know what happened? You're going to be an example to somebody. Two months later, we're in Uganda doing a crusade. And a lady brought a baby up whose head was bigger than a, than a grown-up's head. And that baby wasn't three months old. And Josh Jr. took that little baby in his arms and cried and said, Father, I know you love this baby. And he said, I speak to this head right now to go down and be the size that God intended for it to be. And I watched that baby's head just go right to a baby's. So that was something that Josh had seen in all those trips and he realized that that's what we're called to do. Amen. Somebody told me Josh is pastoring somewhere down by Houston now. California boy came to Texas. Amen. That was a side note, but... I'm talking about what are you going to do with the anointing? Hey, when I talk about these things, this is stuff we should do every day. Not in Uganda, Tanzania. This church, God gave us a vision when we came here. He gave me a word. He said, you'll be known for 90 miles around as a healing center. And we've had people come with terminal cancer, lung cancer. She came because she heard that we'd lay hands on her. As far as I know, she's still alive. It's been about a year and a half since I heard from her. She lived, lived at Greenville. We have to remember, God is going to open the door for us to be used by the Spirit if we just listen. What are you going to do with the anointing? I pray that you'll listen and that you'll operate, whether you're watching by Internet or by television, that you'll realize how important you are to God. I hope you all have been inspired by what we've talked about the last couple of weeks. I know that I have been re-inspired. Don't ever let down. Push on.